Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of White House Chronicle, which is coming right up. But first, a few thoughts of my own. It is the end of another year, a momentous year in many, many ways. I could run through the list of things. We will talk about them on this program today. Uh, but a few that stand out to me. There are about 60 million refugees in the world. That is terrifying. At home, domestically, things are not as bad as the political discussion would suggest. Unemployment is down to reasonable numbers. It's been halved. Uh, there are jobs. They're not all well-paid jobs. The large domestic problem, seems to me, is in the imbalance in earning between the few and the many. Internationally, it depends which bit of the world you're looking at. There are parts of it which are quite stable, quite encouraging. Uh, much of Latin America is quite encouraging at the moment. If you, get, if you can s subtract the drugs from Central America, things would be going quite well. Africa has its problems. It has problems in the north with ISIS, with the Islamic Revolution, and it has problems always with bad political leadership, and that its economies are too dependent on commodities. But Western Europe, people have been living quite well. Lots to worry about. Greece, uh, and yet a huge flood of, of immigrants from Syria. And yet it hasn't been a terrible year in Europe. And in North America, I submit, it's been quite a good year, although there are problems. There have been revelations of things that are not right that need to be fixed, and particularly relationships between the police, minorities, that kind of thing. But a mixed year, I say, and I'm happy to tell you that I look forward to the next one because I'd rather, I think overall, I rather enjoyed this one. I have to talk about these things and anything else that comes to mind in this year-end ramble through the immediate history of the times. Linda Gasparello of this program. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Llewellyn. Did you have a good year? I did. Good, and I'm very glad to welcome Graham Weiss from Inside Sources, which is the outfit which syndicates my columns. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Graham. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. As you said, I'm a political reporter for Inside Sources. We're a, a DC-based wire service, uh, primarily covering politics and public policy, uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate your column. And, uh, and we're welcome to the broadcast. A very interesting man, Aya uh, Josia Fudua. Fudua. <laughs> Uh, Josiah Fadua. Fadua. Yes. Well, you can't blame me. It's not a very common it's name. Not it's not the very, easiest <laughs> name. Very distinguished name. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's from Sierra Leone, right? Uh -huh. My family's from Sierra Leone. I was born here. And now you name. have a rather interesting story because you, you actually were a mathematician <laughs> originally, and that was the direction you were headed in till what happened? Well, yeah, mathematician uh, is one way to call it. <laughs> um, but uh, what happened was growing up, um, my dad pretty much gave me two options. I could be a doctor or I could be an engineer. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> Both involve math. Right, exactly. So there's no escaping math. So the it's doctor, it's counting the money and the engineer. <laughs> it's stuck. Exactly. Um, my handwriting, I think, was too good for being a doctor. So I kind of <laughs> went towards the engineering route. There um, was journalism. Bad handwriting yeah. fits in there. Does it? Yes, it does. Oh, it does. <laughs> well, never Poverty, too. Towards that as well. And poverty, yeah. And so um, now, oh, what are you doing now? So um, I uh, ended up not pursuing engineering, um, and I went to college and kind of got into, like, education policy and public policy and impacting change and, you know, coming out and being a change agent. I feel a lot of us millennials really feel that <laughs> you can do a lot more now that we have the Internet and access to, you know, all these, like, social social media uh, mediums. Um, so I got into um, kind of community work. Um, I was uh, working for AmeriCorps and did um, education um, access um, work, particularly for getting uh, students into college. Um, and now I am a director of operations at a um, nonprofit, the Oppor Opportunities Industrialization Center in Rhode Island, and we do workforce development. Ro in Rhode Island, and you're of course based in Washington. In That's right. Where Inside Sources is based. That's right. Linda Gasparella, what are the great events of this 
this year that's closing? Uh, lots of great events. Um, uh, great events in that they had a tremendous impact for better or for worse on the country and the world. And I think one of the things that really sticks out to me is, is it was a year that was marked by violence, mm -hmm. a lot of gun violence. From December of, uh, from June of this year all the way to December, when we looked at the mass shootings at the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, to the mass shootings at the recruitment center in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then the mass shootings at the college in Roseburg, Oregon, and then finally we ended off the year with a mass shooting in San Bernardino, California. And I think that at this point, um, there is a, a feeling, I think, in both political can I parties. Let interrupt you and just yes. point out, it's not the mass shootings that really take the lives, it's the 30,000 shootings or the 30,000 lives lost to guns Absolutely. that count. We, we see the mass shootings and are horrified with those that will, will take place in Chicago Single tonight shootings, and right. Baltimore shooting, tonight shootings. and Los Angeles right. the guns, tonight, the guns. nobody cares. Right. Yeah. Or nobody's counting them as this continuing public health problem of gun violence. I am somewhat encouraged by the fact that um, Harry Reid uh, in the Senate had said that next year Democrats would do something about this gun violence. We don't know what it is, but at the same point, there was a statement there. I know it's been a non-starter in Congress, you know, yeah. many for many, many years, of course. But maybe, maybe we're at a turning point with that. Yeah. I mean, this is an, an issue, I think, um, that you know, it will be interesting to see if anything comes of that next year. I mean, the, the country, um, although everyone obviously mourns the loss of life, the country is quite divided on uh, what should be done about it. Very I mean, divided. You, know, you, you framed it uh, as a public health issue uh, and presumably one that, that maybe government should um, be addressing. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, among Republicans, among conservatives, um, it, it is uh, just uh, the idea of gun control is anathema. And so I think... Um, um, you, you know, as we look. Oh, I know the lots of people to whom it is an absolute anathema, mm -hmm. um, and this is the most sacred of the freedoms. Uh, right, and they believe that, and they're not going to be easily changed. Right. And President uh, Obama. But what, what do you right. see of the other big events this year, domestically well, or internationally? I think I think that uh, everything that's been discussed is certainly true. The, the refugee uh, crises. Um, I think I, I've at inside, at inside sources I've been covering uh, the presidential campaign and and um, the ramp up to 2016. So um, the, that's certainly uh, a, a major uh, concern. So, for example, um, looking at the the Democrats uh, just had their uh, last uh, debate of the year, uh, and uh, you know you have Hillary Clinton really maintaining, I think, a commanding um, st uh, uh, position in that field. Uh, she faces something of a, um, a challenge from Bernie Sanders on the left, uh, and he has uh, energized um, a lot of, of liberals and, and drawn huge he crowds has, at, he has at rallies. He brought out a, 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 a an extensive left wing constituency right. that people didn't know existed. What are the great issues for you? Yeah, um, not to you know also you know speak for all millennials, but I, I do think this was a very interesting year for the millennial perspective. I think as we speak of what's been happening domestically and internationally, I think this was one of the biggest years where there was so much happening internationally that affected us domestically. And I think this has been a, a big year of looking outward, and I think a big year also for thinking of what it means to be inclusive. I think um, beyond the millennial generation has kind of um, seen our struggle and you know jokingly have tried to take over. But I think this year we've also seen how many others are affected by so many different structural like issues. And I think f if you look at refugees, if you look at some of the issues this that happened happen once before. This yeah. was the 1960s. Mm. In the 1960s, there was the civil rights movement, the right. environmental movement, right. the Vietnam War, which dominated, uh, and the women's movement. Mm -hmm. And the the baby boomers, as they were then known, they took over. Right. And they took over by controlling in a sense, journalism and the courts. Mm -hmm. They were very smart, they were very articulate, they were going, coming through law school, they were going into journalism. And of course, they had a very personal interest because they were liable for the draft. Right. I, I haven't seen anything as 
as as, momentous. as big as yeah. what happened in the 1960s yeah, in the it, current millennial and movement. And it's hard to see, and I think what's interesting about how millennials you know, show what they're doing, it's, it's in ways that um, haven't been you know, as common. I think we're not as much as going out there and necessarily protesting, even though that is happening. You can see that, that with the is. Black Lives it might, Matter. It, but it online, the it may, be, seen, uh, it may be that their big impact will be through social media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and those of us who are not deeply committed to social media really don't understand oh, no, its yeah. impact. Do you think you do, uh, well, Graham? I think, I think his, his point uh, about, or, or the point that was just made about, uh, millennials have been driving a lot of the activism on college campuses and, uh, the, you know, the, 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 you, you mentioned at the, at the outset the um, t tensions between police and, and com communities of color primarily. A lot of the activism on, on those issues has been driven by young people. Um, and I think that uh, another significant uh, fact is that uh, millennials this year overtook um, Generation X as the largest share of the labor force so so um, so so workplace policies and employers are starting to think about um, how to uh, you know welcome in the, the next generation uh, to the extent that uh, this generation is able to find uh, employment which is certainly tough yeah Linda if you accept my introduction that things aren't that bad in the US and that unemployment is coming down the economy is stabilized but things are pretty bad internationally and Obama who may take credit for the the situation domestically uh, can't take credit for the mess in Syria, the mess throughout the Middle East, spreading into 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 other parts of uh, um, of the world, like North Africa, uh, and of course the subcontinent. No, but more events, um, you know, international events. Um, I think this year have been again uh, another many many breakthroughs there. The Iran nuclear deal, for one, I think that was a huge breakthrough. I mean, here we've That's, got that has fended off a war. Absolutely, we've got we have got you know, Iran's nuclear programs have been curtailed. Uh, one of its facilities is going to be used for research. Another facility is is going to be able uh, only to enrich uranium to uh, three point six percent, and that's Natanz. Um, so that's only can be used for for civilian nuclear uses. There's a snapback provision for sanctions. There is an inspections regime, regime set up. And I think it was a mom, really a momentous deal. But um, Republicans have not signed on. Not yet. No. We have an interesting thing where internationally people are signing on, as they did to that. They signed on to global warming. Another huge development, the Paris Conference, right. the acceptance, the acceptance the that we have conference. to do something before it's too late, if it's not too late. And yet Republicans are not signing on. They're becoming a party a minority <laughs> in the world not a minority in the U.S. Well, and I think a lot of these issues, uh, that's true on, on a lot of these issues. I, I was, uh, I wrote a piece for InsideSources.com about the uh, president defending uh, the nuclear deal in a speech at American University, which is my alma mater uh, in Washington. Um, you and, and David Gregory. <laughs> that's yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> who uh, appears to have a new book out coming out um, in the new year. So, um, but speaks very good French, you know. <laughs> and and has stories about traveling with George W. Bush and speaking. I was China. there. Uh, I was there in the Elysee right. Palace when they got into it in Paris. But, but if anyway. you you know if, take those three issues and and issues that have already been brought up, the issue of uh, gun control, the issue of. Um, Shall we say international action on on climate change, um, the Iran deal? I, you know, I think that the conservative movement uh, in America uh, uh, feels as though uh, there are certain uh, principles of limited government that are that make America exceptional, that make America you know different um, from other countries uh, around the world, particularly in Europe. Um, and so they frame that as uh, you know America not wanting to uh, go down the road that European countries uh, have have done in terms of uh, restrictions. On gun ownership, but you are certainly right that it it that m puts America really on its on its own among among countries in the world uh, and not embracing those kinds of policies. And it definitely puts the Republican Party on its own <laughs> in not embracing these policies. That's true. But, but the true. public the world. remember we have a majority in Congress of Republicans. Absolutely. So the public, yeah, absolutely. The public may be out there on its own, not embracing. <laughs> right. That's right. right. Um, I I, I think that we're fighting a shibboleth. Uh, domestically, and that is that people think things are worse than they are, that we've lost our place in the world, that we're, that we're trashed, the sort of thing that uh, the extreme Donald Trump says, but which many other conservatives say to lesser extent. I was very impressed when the conservative economist, Erwin Stelzer, said, hey, 
Business has signed on to global warming. Get with it. Get with Don't it. fight yeah. it anymore. Mm -hmm. and the most important thing he said about Paris, without getting involved in endorsing it, was business has signed on. They can't take the liability of saying it ain't so. Right. They will right. be in terrible trouble. And right. that's hugely significant. Yeah. And thinking of millennials, I mean, I think uh, that issue, the issue of needing to take some kind of action to address climate change is certainly an issue where um, folks in our generation uh, want to hear from, from uh, you know, politicians and elected officials of all political stripes. And, uh, you know, I think it, it will hurt Republicans long term if they don't have something to say on that issue. I, yeah, I, I want to talk I about education with you in a moment, but I'm going to take a little uh, identification break. Uh, <laughs> Primarily for the benefit of our listeners on Sirius XM Radio, the POTUS channel, channel 124, where we are aired four times on the weekend. You are listening to White House Chronicle with myself, Llewellyn King, Linda Gasparello of this program, uh, Graham Weiss of Inside Sources, and Aya Josiah Fadawa. I'm this so program can <laughs> also be seen worldwide on the English language programs of the Voice of America, radio and television. We are viewed on about 200 domestic television screens. All right, Aya. Yeah. Uh, education. education. What's wrong with it? Why can't we fix it? And oh, why no. can't we fix well, it? Well, how about this year, in this year in terms of education? Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of um, strife that as um, or a lot of um, issues that have come out I think there's become a lot of emphasis on what's lacking in our schools and I think we've talked about um, issues of, of standardized testing we've kind of like run that through the wall we have talked about um, putting more requirements on teachers and I think we've pushed at some of the structural issues so much that I think those conversations have kind of come to like dead end, you know? And, and I think we've started to think about the way that we think about education being a bigger conversation. And I think um, from the policy side, I think recently we had a, a, a huge um, improvement with um, Obama being able to finally, you know, repeal some of the decisions that we, you know, have been there since Race to the Top. And I think like what's coming in education mm -hmm. is re-looking at how we're even introducing. I think the biggest change with that policy is going to be um, preschools and kindergarten. It's early ed. And it's really like looking at how we're entering students into our education system. Because if we try to change the structural things that are happening in middle and high schools, we're realizing that it's the way we're approaching education from the beginning that is, is a serious issue. And I think I, think, I, think I, I like where we're going in it. And I, I think the direction is becoming more positive. But I think the the primary um, benefit we're having is that we've realized that it's, it's the fundamentals that we need to go back to. How do to. we get children to, once again, be enthusiastic about finding out? Yeah. Uh, that's what it's all about, yeah. finding right, out. Sort of the awe of education. Right, and I think what, ha what, we've, what has happened is schools have become, uh, have fit into such traditional, structural, you know, um, um, folds that they're not allowing for innovation to happen. They're not allowing for as much creativity to happen. Um, and so I think it's giving schools, giving administrators, giving educators the um, freedom, the ability to be more dynamic with their curriculum. And I mean, if you look, you know, at Rhode Island, there are other places like the Center for Dynamic Learning that are going into schools and like really, you know, fighting against some of these like structural, you know, um, bureaucratic necessities and working their way around them. And it's interesting them. too because it seems that we're we're going, we're trying to go back to what right. we had in other years. Right. We had teachers in the grade school level that used to go, had kids going on field trips. Yeah. You know, really they go to the Museum of uh, Science in yeah. Boston or the Museum of Fine Arts. And right. they had the time to do that. That was something that teachers were encouraged to do. Right. Come up with these great field trips, you know, do things, you know, that really blow the minds of the kids. Right. And that has just been Don't, so uh, regimented. You, There's you, so much it, rigidity you're saying, now. I think that, exactly. people, that maybe children learn more through the... the, the, the Creativity. The non, I have brought that the, up. The theater and music and all of the, oh, the non-curricular yes. uh, issues or things that used to be in the curriculum Absolutely. or which are not now. Even languages. Gone, um, gone. Yeah. You know, I, I still remember the Shakespeare I learned in school. Hmm. It's been incredibly valuable to me. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have learned it otherwise. Right. I might have gone to a lot of Shakespearean plays, but I wouldn't have it in my organically stitched in into me in the same way. When I was in elementary school, we had a poetry way. class. Yeah. I mean, this was this was part of our yeah. first. It helped us 
to learn how to speak properly. But right. the other thing was it was I just I would like to just poetry. point out that difficulties with education are not peculiar to the United States. No, they're not. Most advanced countries are having educational problems. The very bright kids, it doesn't matter. They're going to get them. They're going to acquire it because they have the curiosity and the desire. And probably the home pushing right. is where you don't have the home pushing, right. where you don't have the same uh, reward from knowledge. Right. Uh, it is striking, though, thinking of changing education policies and President Obama uh, at least uh, repealing or, or, or uh, making modifications mm -hmm. to the Bush era, no child left behind a law. Um, this is, I think, an underappreciated uh, shift that may be taking place in the presidential campaign. Um, Barack Obama, when he when he came to office, uh, ad essentially adopted the thrust of uh, the reforms that George W. Bush implemented. And as was noted, um, there's a large focus on standardized testing, a large focus on um, t uh, sort of merit pay for teachers and, and tied to that testing. Um, and Hillary Clinton was never really on board with uh, a lot of the same policies that, uh, that, that, that Barack Obama embraced. And so I, I think one of the um, narratives that we may see uh, come going into 2016 is that Hillary Clinton sort of moves away from the the, the kind of policies that um, George W. Bush and then uh, to, to, a, to a slightly different extent Barack Obama embraced and um, she for example um, has a much better relationships with teachers unions um, than uh, President mm -hmm. Obama has um, they're 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 more favorable to uh, the the agenda that she's putting forth um, it hasn't gotten a lot of uh, attention yet for obvious reasons there's a lot going on in the world but um, that's that's something you should watch. Um, you now, I'm not year. sure that I know across the board what Hillary is for. Mm -hmm. I, I know who she is. <laughs> Hard not to. Right. But Everyone. what is she for? What can we expect of her if she is elected? What do you think? I, I mean, I think she... Uh, is a is a, a, a fairly mainstream uh, Democratic politician. Uh, I, you know, there there is this thought that she is um, a, a bit more moderate or, or more to the center than uh, than Bernie Sanders uh, is, and which is why he has carved out this space for himself uh, on the left. Um, but she is also uh, embracing a lot of uh, the, his his focus on economic populism and inequality. You wrote uh, a column uh, for Inside Sources about Elizabeth Warren, um, and and uh, you know she certainly has been a leader on those issues. I think uh, there's a thought that Hillary Clinton may be uh, just a notch more hawkish on foreign policy than the current president. Um, she, she, uh, you know, maybe a little more muscular, um, but, but you know, there's no appetite uh, right now in the country for uh, ground war and all of the politicians uh, know that, uh, ground war, war in the Middle East, I should say. Um, so I think uh, she, she represents uh, continuity largely with what the President Obama has done. And you're right, it will be interesting to see uh, how she frames herself as, uh, you know, change or uh, something new in the new year. I had a community activist, you know, Hillary Clinton, and... I think from the community activist point, I think, you know, um, most, um, and particularly like millennials, I think gravitate a little bit more towards like a Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. just because of um, how vocal he's kind of willing to be. And I think we see a little bit of a rigidity behind, you know, um, Hillary and a little bit of a I'm going to be the president, I'm going to be the candidate you want me to be. But we kind of are looking towards those who are really going to go in and shake Congress up. Like that, I think, is a thing from the community side, from the millennial side, is we want someone who's going to really be a champion, someone who's really going to go against the grain. And I don't think that Hillary has kind of come out strongly enough seeming as that candidate. It's kind of more like, I will play the I think, game. A I little think there's bit more. one thing she will look strongly at, which is equal pay and also the yeah. minim, rising minimum, minimum wage, which mm. are both things. Which that brings us to a subject that we haven't uh, uh, dealt with, the two we haven't really touched on. <laughs> one is China, and the other is the problem with the police and the minorities. Right. Sorry, go ahead. May I just bring up something else which I thought was a Please. momentous decision um, this year in the Supreme Court? Five four decision on same sex marriage. Yeah. Legal Huge. in 50 states yeah. and 6-3 six, three, six, three on Obamacare being able to be purchased yeah. by low-income Americans. Yeah. I was astounded by, right. b by both of those decisions. I had never expected that the Supreme Court would go there uh, in June, and I was stunned by it. I, uh, what are we going to do about the... We, we don't want a situation like Baltimore where murders have gone up because the police are not, yeah. are not performing because the police... 
feel they'll be prosecuted if yeah. they do, and besides, they're very upset because right. of the death of, the, uh, of Gray. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, ta Coates uh, wrote a very um, impactful book, uh, Between the World and Me, and um, it, you know, kind of came around a lot of circles that I was in, and, and, and it was clear that it was having a widespread impact. And I think w something that he communicated in that book that I think, you know, was very uh, prudent and very important was that, you know, the police um, act as an arm of an ar already existing feelings. You know, they act as the the force behind what society already, you know, They also have a very of. tough time of it. Yeah, and they have you a know, tough time. Baltimore can be, I lived in Baltimore at mm. one time, and uh, it's a very segregated city, right. and it always has been. Right. More so, it's not really a southern city, but it's right. been severely segregated. Yeah. There's a great indifference right. between the classes, not only between the, the Caucasians and the African Americans, but generally between classes and in those classes, mm -hmm. That's right. uh, this is a this is almost a Victorian city. This is not a, a city of the 21st century in that way. Right. Uh, but nobody quite knows how to fix it. I mean, I think, the, and again, a thing that's communicated with the with you know, what Coates is saying is that the problem is the race issue, and that's an issue that is happening in the mentality of America. It's happening in the way that we're growing. It's happening it's in our schools. and It's, it's just a large being subject, and we'll come back to it in yeah. another program. Linda, very quickly, China. China is the big thing on the radar. Are we going to live happily with China or not? I say keep your eye on the South China Sea uh, and whether or not we have a tussle with China uh, you know, a fight with them, is, is this going to be over the right in international waters or is it going to be a might problem? You so know what worries me about China? And it's been true of every dictatorship essentially that we've seen and that is not enough ideas within the country mm. so they don't know about their own government's actions. Um, I saw it, I saw it in, in South Africa, I saw it in the Soviet Union. If there are no ideas circulating, there are no solutions. And the solutions offered by the regime are the acceptable solutions because there are no other ideas. South Africa was interesting. It wasn't because of, there was a restriction on the media. There simply wasn't enough media. So there were more ideas about what to do in so about South Africa in London and Washington than there were in Johannesburg and Pretoria. I think we're just about out of time for this year. I wish you all a very prosperous and fabulous new year. And uh, that is our show. We thank you for coming along. We thank you for the time. We hope you're going to come back next year. And we hope that it's going to be a truly bumper year for you in 2016.